All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's talks at Google. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Delgado, and I have the pleasure today to introduce uh, Father Gregory Boyle to us Googlers here. Um, so Father G, as, as the homies call you, it's really an honor to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for joining. I, I thought I'd start by first giving um, the audience a bit about your background. So um, Father G is a native of Los Angeles, and for six years he's served as a pastor at the Dolores Mission Church in Boyle Heights. And while he was there, he witnessed the devastating impact that uh, gang activity was having in the city of Los Angeles. And at the time, there was a lot of law enforcement tactics to try to combat gang violence, such as mass incarceration. Um, but Father G and his parish, they decided to take a different approach, which was to treat gang members as human beings. And so in 1988, they started what would eventually become Homeboy Industries. And what Homeboy does is they employ and train former gang members in a range of social enterprises. And they also provide really critical services such as job training, tattoo removal, and mental health services to thousands of men and women who walk through their doors every year. Um, for this amazing work, Father G has received numerous honors, including being named a champion of change by President Barack Obama, uh, the California Peace Prize, and he's currently on Gavin Newsom's Economic jo uh, Job and Recovery Task Force for COVID-19. And then most recently, in breaking news, uh, just a few weeks ago, Homeboy was at, um, awarded the prestigious Conrad N. Hilton Humanitarian Award. Uh, for those of you who aren't in the space, this award is a really, really big deal. It's the largest award of its kind, and it's awarded to organizations that work to alleviate human suffering. And Homeboy Industries is the first US-based organization in the 20-year history of the award to win this prize. So congratulations to you, Father G, and to all the men and women working at Homeboy to do this great work. Um, so with that, I thought I'd pass it over to you, Father G, to tell us more about what you what you all are doing at Homeboy. Thank you, Jocelyn. It's a pr privilege to be with all of you, and uh, thank you for your kindness. Um, you know, all of us are invited to uh, embrace a vision that will kind of be more expansive and spacious than uh, maybe to which we are accustomed. We're all invited to stand at the margins, I think, in our own particularity. And that's the way that the margins get erased if we stand out at them. We're all invited, I think, to uh, imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle. And to that end, we're urged, I think, to uh, dismantle the barriers that exclude. And so we stand with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. And we stand with those whose dignity has been denied and those whose burdens are more than they can bear. And we're all invited to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out. We stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. And we stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. We stand at the margin so that we can create a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it. And of course, we brace ourselves because the world will accuse us of wasting our time. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. And so we stand at the margins so that other voices might get heard. Homeboy Industries, uh, as Jocelyn mentioned, was started in 1988. I was the pastor of the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles, Dolores Mission, nestled in the middle of two public housing projects the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. We had eight gangs at war with each other. The LAPD called my parish the place of the highest concentration of gang activity in all of the city. So if LA was the gang capital of the world, my parish was the gang capital uh, of Los Angeles. And so the first thing we did was we started a school because there were so many junior high, middle school age gang members who had been given the boot from their home school. And so nobody wanted to uh, 
uh, teach them. And so they were in the projects uh, wreaking havoc. They were writing on the walls, selling drugs. They were um, violent. So I walked out to the projects and I would talk to them and I'd sort of isolate them one at a time. And I'd say, hey, you know, if I found you a school that would take you, would you go? And to my surprise, um, they all said, yeah, you know, I would. And then I couldn't find a school that would take them. That's, so that sort of forced my hand. And right across the street from the church was our uh, elementary school, our parochial school, grades K to eight which occupied the first two floors, but the entire huge third floor was the convent where uh, the nuns lived. So I gather all the sisters in the living room one evening and I said, hey, you know, would you guys mind, you know, moving out and we could turn the convent into a school for gang members. And they looked at each other and they said, sure. So we were off and running. Gang members came in large numbers to the church property, uh, which created something of a disconnect. People in the parish would kind of uh, sidle up to me and say, uh, hey, you know, aren't churches supposed to be hermetically sealed? You know, good people in and bad people out, which I thought was a good gospel challenge. And then the gang member said, if only we had jobs. So myself and the women in the parish, we marched around the factories that surrounded the projects trying to find felony friendly employers and that wasn't so forthcoming so we created things you know maintenance crew a landscaping crew a, a graffiti removal crew all made up of members of the eight gangs uh, from the parish in 1988 I buried my first young person killed because of the sadness. And I buried my 236th two weeks ago, a young woman named Brandy. So it was a daunting, vexing social dilemma at the time, and it remains so. So in 1992, the unrest hit after the Rodney King uh, verdict and the entire city of Los Angeles exploded, every pocket of poverty, except the poorest pocket. My parish didn't, and so the LA Times wanted to know why that was, and so they asked me. And I said, well, I think it's because we had 60 strategically hired rival enemy gang members who, who had a reason to get up in the morning, and they were working side by side, and you can't demonize people you know, and. I think so they had a reason not to torch their own community. So the article appeared in the LA Times and uh, the following day, I'm summoned to the Beverly Hills office of Ray Stark, who was a movie producer who happened to have $500 million. And he said, how should I spend my money? I, I look back on that and I, I can see that I woefully undershot my request, but I said, um, you know, there's an abandoned bakery across the street from the school. It's got ovens. They don't work, but you could fix them. You could buy the building. We could put hair nets on rival enemy gang members and um, they could bake bread. I don't know. We could call the place Homeboy Bakery which was the entire extent of my business plan. And he said, terrific. And so we were off and running once again. A month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market. Once we had plural, we changed our name from Jobs for a Future, which we had previously called ourselves, and changed it to Homeboy Industries, as if there was any industry involved in this. Not everything worked, I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. Homeboy plumbing really was not hugely successful. Who knew? Uh, apparently people didn't want gang members in their homes. I did not see that coming. And now well, we have backed our way into becoming the largest gang intervention rehab reentry program on the planet. Pre-pandemic, anyway, we had 15,000 folks walking through our doors trying to imagine 
a new life and a future for themselves. Every gang member, man or woman who walks through our doors comes barricaded behind a wall of shame and disgrace and only tenderness can scale that wall. Homeboy begins as being a safe place, a safe haven, a sanctuary, if you will. And then the homies become the sanctuary they sought. And then they go home and they present that sanctuary to their kids and suddenly you've broken a cycle. Every gang member walks through our doors with what psychologists would call a disorganized attachment. Mom was either frightened or frightening, and you can't calm yourself down if you've never been soothed. If it's true enough that, uh, you know, the traumatized are most likely to cause trauma and damage, then it's equally true that the cherished will find their way to the joy there is in cherishing themselves and others. Our goal is not so much surviving as the fittest, but thriving as the nurtured. And so it's about healing. And if for 18 months in our training program, a gang member surrenders and cooperates with this healing, this foundational essential healing, then they leave us after 18 months and they're resilient in a way they've never been and the world will throw at them what it will, but they won't be toppled by it this time. And so we have therapy and classes and uh, nine social enterprises and uh, free tattoo removal, but it's the culture of the place that where people feel held and it's compelling and it's significant. The principal suffering of the poor throughout history has been shame and disgrace. And how do we dismantle those messages? How do we hold the mirror up and tell people the truth that they're exactly what God had in mind when God made them and then they become that truth, then they inhabit that truth and no bullet can pierce it. No four prison walls can keep it out. And death can't touch it because it's huge. But, but we have to reach in at Homeboy and we have to do a great deal of dismantling and reminding people so that they can find their true selves in loving. In the Acts of the Apostles, they have an odd kind of line and it says simply, and awe came upon everyone. And it suggests that the measure of health in any community at all may well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what the poor have to carry rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. A number of years ago, I was invited to speak to 600 social workers in Richmond, Virginia. And it was one of the, these things we call gang, a gang in service. So it was from the nine to five and the social workers took over a hotel ballroom and, and you have workshops and keynotes and breakout sessions and experts come in to talk about uh, gang involvement and such, and they get credits for it. So I said yes, figuring I'd, I'd do a, a keynote or something. And, and a week before I was to fly, uh, I pull out the original letter and to my horror, it says that I'm to be the only speaker um, that day from nine to five. And I said to myself, oh, hell no, I'm not gonna be the only speaker from nine to five. And so I, I pulled two trainees in, Jose and Andres, and uh, they're in the 18 month training program. They were kind of a nine months in to the training program. And I sit them down and I said, look, at the end of the week, you're flying with me to Richmond, Virginia. I want you to get up and speak in front of 600 social workers. I want you to tell your stories. Take your time, 
because we got a long ass day to fill. Well, I'd never heard their stories before. And I remember Jose got up first. He was 25 years old, uh, been to prison, tattooed. At that nine month uh, moment in his 18 months, he, he had sort of become a very valued member of our substance abuse team, a man solid in his own recovery. And now he was helping younger uh, homies with their uh, you know, addiction issues. And, so he gets up, and, and here's a guy who not only was a gang member and in prison, but he also had a long stretch as a, a homeless man and an even longer stretch as a heroin addict. And he looks out at these 600 social workers, and he says, I guess you could say my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I think I was six when she looked at me and she said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, 600 social workers audibly gasp. And then he says, it, it sounds way worse in Spanish. And then they all laughed. I've, I've never seen it was whiplash to go so quickly from gasp to laugh. And then he continued, he said, I guess I was nine when my mom took me to the deepest part of Baja California and she walks me up to an orphanage and she knocks on the door and the guy comes to the door and she says, I found this kid and she left me there for 90 days until my grandmother could get out of her where she had dumped me and my grandmother rescued me My mom beat me every single day with things you could imagine and a lot of things you couldn't. Every day, my back was bloodied and scarred. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school every day. First t-shirt, because the blood would seep through, and second t-shirt, you, you could still see it. Finally, the third t-shirt, you couldn't see any blood. Kids at school, they'd make fun of me. Hey, fool, it's 100 degrees. Why are you wearing three t-shirts? And then Jose stopped speaking so overwhelmed with emotion, and he seemed to be staring at a piece of his story that only he could see. And when he could regain his composure, he said through his tears, I wore three t-shirts well into my adult years because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see them. But now I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my scars. My wounds are my friends. After all, how can I help heal the wounded if I don't welcome my own wounds? And awe came upon everyone. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but only in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. For the truth of the matter is this, if we don't welcome our own wounds, we may well be tempted to despise the wounded. The Buddhists uh, say often, oh, nobly born, remember who you truly are. And I think that's the task at Homeboy Industries. People know that they're valuable if you value them, if you cherish them, if you welcome them. The homies are used to saying, you know, we're used to being watched. We're not used to being seen. 
there's uh, the, the old Christmas carol from O Holy Night, and it says, Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. And yet it's about Jesus, and yet it's about Christmas, but how is it not the job description of every human being who happens to be the proud owner of a pulse? You appear and the soul feels its worth. Oh, nobly born. I remember there was a homie, we all called him Bandit. He was something of a bandit. And uh, and I would ride my bike in the projects late at night and he lived in Aliso Village. And he was from a gang. Um, so he was into gang banging and all that crazy stuff. and. And I'd be straddling my beach cruiser, talking to his homies. I could see him in the little parking lot, running up to a car and selling crack cocaine. And he'd come back and he'd be counting his money. And uh, he'd see me. I wish I could say he was embarrassed, but he wasn't. I'd hand him my card for the umpteenth time. I'd say, call me when you're ready to hang up your gloves. And he kind of never did until he finally did. He walked into my office at Homeboy Industries. And I couldn't believe it. I said, y ese milagro. What brought you here today after all these years of knowing you? And he looked at me with a great sadness. And he said, I'm tired of being tired. And so he worked there. But he worked on himself, which is sort of the task. And he ceased to be a stranger to himself. And he came to terms with what was done to him. And he excavated his wounds. And he came to terms with the things he's done. And he discovered himself to be, oh, nobly born. And he saw who he really was. And when he finished his time with us, we uh, in our we have job developers and workforce development people who who try to make it a seamless uh, transition between their 18 months with us and then employment outside of Homeboy. And he got some entry level warehouse gig. And before too long, he worked his way up. And five years in, he was a supervisor and. And even more years later, he was uh, el metal chingon of the whole place. He was running the place and had a home and married and three kids. I hadn't heard from him in a really long time. And with gang members, no news is good news. And But he calls me on a Friday afternoon, kind of panicky in his voice. He goes, gee, you got to bless my daughter. I said, que paso, Mico? Is she sick? Is she in the hospital? He said, oh, no, no. On Sunday, she's going to Humboldt College. Imagine my oldest, my Jessica. But she's a little chaparita, and she's 18 years old, and Humboldt's far. It's way up north, and I don't know. We're scared for her. Do you think you could give her a blessing before she goes? And I said, oh, Miko, I'd be honored. Look, tomorrow's Saturday. I have baptisms at 1. Why don't you guys all come at 1230? We'll do a little send-off prayer. And uh, right at 12.30, there's Bandit and his wife and the three kids, including tiny little Jessica. And so we stand in front of the altar, and I put Jessica in the middle. I said, let's surround her. Let's touch her. Put your hands on her shoulder. Go ahead. Put your hands on her head. And I tell them to bow their heads and to close their eyes. And... Um, as the homies say, I do a long ass prayer. You know, I go on and on and on. And somewhere in the middle of this thing, I notice we've all become chiones. We're all just crying and and sloppy crying. And I don't know why we're crying, except for the fact that Band Bandit and his wife don't know anybody who's ever gone to college except me. Certainly nobody in their families. So we finished the prayer and we're kind of wiping our eyes and we're laughing at how 
mushy we got. And so I, I go to kind of change the subject. And I look at Jessica and I say, hey, what are you going to study at Humboldt College? And she was very quick, forensic psychology. And I go, damn, forensic psychology? And Bandit chimes in over here, yeah, she's going to study the criminal mind. And Jessica turns and looks at her father, and she does one of these, you know, and and he laughs and sees her and says, yep, I'm going to be her first subject. So we go out to the parking lot, and uh, big abrazos, and they all pile in the car. We say goodbye. But Bandit hangs back, and I'm, I'm glad he has. And I say, sabes que me cool. I give you so much credit for the man you've chosen to become. I'm proud of you. And his eyes well up with tears and he says, you know what? I'm proud of myself. All my life, people called me a low life, a bueno para nada. I guess I showed him. I said, yeah, I, I guess you did. And the soul feels its worth. Exactly right. And so we go to the margins and we have something in mind. We create a community of kinship such that God might recognize it. The poet Wallace Stevens says, we live in the description of the place, but not in the place itself. We're meant to hold out for the place itself, where there is no us and them, where we obliterate the illusion that we are separate. Mother Teresa was right. The problem in the world is that we've forgotten that we belong to each other. And so we stand at the margins and look under our feet and the margins get erased because we chose to stand there. And we don't go to the margins to make a difference. We go to the margins so that the folks at the margins make us different. And we stand against forgetting that we belong to each other. And we look at each other in the eyes and we say, oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. And pretty soon we cease to care if anyone accuses us of wasting our time at the margins. For in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. Let's allow those voices to be heard. Thank you very much. Thank you um, for the introduction uh, to everything that takes place here at Homeboys. Um, thank everybody for being a part of this conversation. I'm Jose Ariano. I'm a director at Homeboy Industries, um, director of case management and navigation. But before I was a director, I actually walked through the doors and uh, and seeking a job. I thought at first, you know, so. Uh, at a young age, I got involved in gangs. Growing up in the household that I grew up in, um, everybody in my household was involved with gangs, drugs, and uh, you know, just mental illness, substance abuse, domestic violence. So growing up in this household, it was the norm for us to grow up like that. But there was something deep within my heart that always wanted something different than what my circumstances were. So I loved school. My school was my escape. And I would get up in the morning, get myself ready for school. Nobody had to wake me up. I just, I loved being at school. 
And, uh, you know, I had, I actually was blessed. I had an older cousin that, that really looked after me and his situation was similar to mine. We're all from the same gang. My whole family's from the same gang. And he would always make sure that we went to school and he took care of me and, and protected me and was like a brother to me. And so growing up, we understood our situation was, was dire and, and there was a lot of hopelessness all around us. And I remember at a young age, uh, my cousin calls me to my grandmother's backyard and he says, hey, Jose, no matter what happens, like promise me that we won't get jumped into the hood, that we won't get jumped into the gang. And it was an easy response because I didn't want that life. And I remember shaking his hand and I said, I promise you, we promised each other that no matter what happened in our lives, we would never get jumped into a gang. And as time went on, you know, uh, things got worse. My mother was a young gang member and she eventually got caught up with drugs and uh, became addicted to methamphetamine. And, you know, our household became more and more poor. So lights were getting turned on and, and even the water bill, you know, and that's the cheapest bill you can afford. It got it got turned off. The water got turned off. And I remember, you know, having to borrow water from the neighbor. And so we can so we can shower so we can bird bath and wash our dishes. And I hated being at home. So I was always trying to find somewhere else to be. And, and, and I had another friend that lived down the street. His name was Christian. And I loved being at his house because he had like a semi normal life. And he had like basic cable TV and they always had food in their refrigerator. And I would go over there often. And sometimes his mother would have to ask me to leave because I would I would overstay my welcome. Um, so the summer right before junior high school, my cousin uh, out of nowhere got jumped into the gang. And he didn't consult with me, didn't share with me. He just from one day to another, he was from the hood. And so I was always trying to find a way to get away from my house. And so I went to Christian's one night and I knocked at the door and somebody came to the people, but they didn't answer the door. So I knocked again. I said, hey, it's me, Jose. And they didn't answer the door. Then I went to the side. They had a window on the side and, and I knocked on the window and I said, hey, it's me, Jose. And they turned off the living room light and then they turned off the TV and they acted as if nobody was home. And I remember feeling like, damn, you know, there's like nowhere else to go, you know. So I walked back to my house and when I got back to the top of the hill, one of my other cousins who was older, 16 at the time, who was already gangbanging and one of the homies was 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 there. And I remember the homie looked at me and he says, hey, what's up, fool? Why, why you look so sad? Did your dog die or something? And I remember not wanting to tell him, you know, but I said, nah, you know, I'm all right. And then he asks me, he says, you want to get into the neighborhood? And before I could even think about anything, the words had already left my mouth. And I said, yeah, I'll get in. I'll get in tonight. And we walked across the street and they they jumped me. You know, they beat on me. They punched on me. They kicked me. And then they grabbed me and they hugged me and they embraced me. And I got jumped into the hood that night. And about eight months later, my cousin Marlo, my cousin that we had made the promise to never get jumped into a gang. We shook hands in my grandmother's backyard when we were like 11 years old. We promised to never get jumped into the hood. Eight months after we had gotten into the neighborhood, my cousin was shot with a 12 gauge shotgun in the face and he was murdered. He died at 14 years old. And I remember the impact that these experiences, they begin to have on my life. You know, I began to think about, not even think about, I, re I remember feeling like there was no future for me. And so, um, you know, death was at every corner, but then I remember be I began to chase death. I remember that I, I, I started to think about like what my funeral would be like, you know, at 14, 15 years old and who would be there and what, what they would say about me and would they miss me if I was gone. Um, so at 15 years old, I got locked up for the first time. I got out. I went back at 16. I got out when I was 18. I went right back at 18. I got out when I was 22 and I was out for maybe like four or five months and I went right back at 22. And I did another six years. So I practically pretty much grew up in the system. Um, and I remember being like in juvenile hall and seeing sometimes kids getting visits. And I knew that my mother was never coming because she she was so much in her addiction. Um, and I began to resent my life. You know, I began to resent my mother because back then I didn't fully understand what addiction meant and what she was going through. Um, so our relationship became estranged. And the times that I was out on the street, sometimes the homies would tell me, they would say, hey, 
your mom's uh, getting high down the street, you should probably go get her. And I would look at them and I would say, I don't have a mother, homie. And I didn't know who my father was at the time. So I built this armor and this callus around my heart, you know, and I thought, well, this is who I am and this is how I'm supposed to live and this is how I'm going to die. So it was my last term. I had got six years um, and I went upstate. And when I got to state, uh, I was just doing the same thing I had always done, you know, and then I got word that my mother had passed away. And I remember the the impact that that had on, on, on my life and how I felt. And I was in so much pain. I just missed my mom so much. And I had all these regrets and I wish that things could have been different, you know. And I didn't know what to do with that because in prison, I couldn't share that with anybody, how much I had missed my mom. And I couldn't talk about how hurt I was because she had passed. And so I just continued to get by and survive while I was in prison. But I remember um, going to the hole and I was in the hole and I was hurting so much um, that I would cry myself to sleep. I would wait for my Sally to go to bed and then I would, I would check to see if he was asleep and then I would cry myself to sleep. And I started to think about my childhood and, and I started to ask myself, like, how did I get to this point? And I remember in that little cell thinking about a time when I was a kid and I was watching a sitcom. It was called Family Matters. And I was a little boy and I was watching the sitcom called Family Matters. And I remember yearning for what I saw on the TV. As a little kid, I, I yearned to have a father and a mother and those dynamics in my home. And I yearned to like sit down and eat dinner together, like everything I had seen on that sitcom. And here I am, you know, a grown man in prison, all tat tatted up. And I was yearning for that life again. I was yearning for it from the depths of my soul, wishing and hoping that things could be different. And so I got out with that, with 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 that yearning, right? And I didn't know what to do with it. So I, I went straight to work and I was working at the factories in Vernon. And my father-in-law had read a newspaper article and it had homeboys in the article. I remember coming home dirty because I was working all these odd jobs and they would hire me for a week and then let me go. And, and I was trying my best to do good and dealing with all these emotions that I was feeling that I didn't even understand. Anxiety and PTSD and paranoia. But I was doing the best I could with what I had. And I was drinking a lot and I was using drugs on the side. And, and I remember he showed me the number to homeboys. And he said, you should call them, you know, maybe they're hiring. And so I called, I got the number and I called down here and a homie answered the phone. His name was Eddie. And he said, Hey, this is Eddie with Homeboy Industries. How can I help you? And I said, I'm looking for a job. Are you guys hiring right now? And he said, well, let me ask you a few questions first. I said, okay. And he goes, uh, have you ever been involved in gangs? And I look at the phone, like, what kind of question is that? Right. And I tell him the truth. I said, yeah, I've been involved in gangs. I'm from a gang. And he goes, all right. Um, have you ever been locked up before? And I'm tripping out on these questions, right? And I said, yeah, I've been locked up before. Matter of fact, I, I just got out. Okay. Are you on probation or parole? And I'm tripping, right? But I'm answering all these questions and I'm being honest. And, and, and I said, yeah, I'm on parole. I'm on high control parole, actually. And he says, all right. And he says, uh, one last question. He says, uh, do you have any visible tattoos? And I remember taking a moment to look at myself and I, I was all tatted up at that point. I had my hand sleeve, this whole arm. I had tattoos on my face and I have tattoos on my neck. And I remember looking at myself and I, and I said, I'm just going to be honest with him. I said, yeah, homie, I'm all tatted up. And he says, we'll give you a job. And I remember holding the phone away from my face going, are you serious? Are you messing with me? And he says, nah, I'm serious. We'll give you a job. Can you come down here today? And I came down to Homeboys. And I remember walking up, looking in, seeing gang members everywhere. Tattoos, head tattoos, face tattoos. And I remember thinking to myself, this place ain't for me. Because my experience with gang members has always been negative. So coming in, I come in, I get the intake form, and I begin to fill it out. And I remember sitting there and a homie named Mario was a trainee at the time. And now he's in our cafe and he's just one of the most amazing men that I know, one of the most caring and loving men that I know today.
But back then, I didn't know who he was, and he's all tatted up. I mean, tattoos on his eyelids, his face, everywhere. He's covered in tattoos. And I noticed him notice me. And I, and once I noticed him notice me, I put the clipboard down. And I think to myself, everything that I knew, that I thought was going to happen is going to happen now. And as he begins to approach me, my heart begins to race. He walks up to me, and he extends his hand, and he says, my name is Mario. I've never seen you before. Uh, would you like something to drink? Would you like some water or something? And I remember looking at him like the same way I felt about the homie on the phone. Like, what is this place? You know? Um, and he walks off. And then people were just so eager to help me. And as G was saying, I felt like I was seen for the very first time. I felt like I was seen not because of my record or not because of the things I had done or not because of what they call me from the gang I was from. I felt like everybody was seeing me as if they were seeing me for the very first time. And because I felt like that, I had felt I had located my youngest brother and I wanted to bring him. And these experiences are important because the experiences I had as a child, they shaped the way that I viewed myself and they shaped the way that I viewed the world. But when I came to Homeboys, these experiences that I, that I began to have, they begin to reshape my heart and reshape the way that I viewed myself and reshape the way that I seen the world. And I'm going to share this last experience with you because it was one that impacted my life and altered the course of, of my life forever. I brought my brother here and my brother back then didn't speak much. The only way he expressed himself was physically and it was violently. And I didn't know why he didn't talk back then. I found out years later why he didn't speak much. He had been through so many things in his life as a, as a child. But I, I came to G and I asked G, I said, hey, I found my little brother. Can I bring him? And G said, yeah, bring him, son. We'll hire him part time and we'll enroll him in our high school. So I brought my little brother and, uh, you know, he comes in, he starts working, he starts going to school. You know, we, we didn't really have much back then. And so we used to share clothes with each other. And, and I was a lot thinner back then. I was like 60 pounds thinner when I first started out. So if I had this shirt on today, my brother would have it on tomorrow. And, and, and same with the pants. If I had these pants on today, my brother would wear these pants tomorrow and we would swap out. And people here noticed that about us. But we grew up like not to ask anybody for anything because if you ask somebody for something, they would expect it in return. They would expect something back in return. So I would tell my brother, like, we, we just can't add. We got each other and that's it. And so one day we come in and the homie at the front, he says, hey, G wants to talk to you guys. And I remember looking at my brother like, damn, what did you do, homie? And we go into G's office and G's at his desk and he has these two Sears cards. And he reaches across his desk to try to hand them to us. And we say, nah, we're good. We, we don't need anything. We're all right. And he says, take these cards and go buy your guys yourself some clothes. Take them. We took the cards and we leave and we're going down Alameda. And I look over at my little brother and he's crying. He's sobbing. My little brother's sobbing. And growing up, we we were taught like not to cry, not to feel sadness, not to express that emotion because if people seen it, they would take advantage of it. So I look over at my brother and I say, hey, homie, why are you crying? He looks at me and he says, why the fuck do they care about us as he's crying? And in that moment, I see my brother like if I was seeing him for the very first time. I see my brother for the child and the little boy that he that he was. And in my heart, I remember I didn't have the words, but I remember feeling because you're worthy, homie because you deserve to be seen like that. And I knew in that moment that I wanted to be able to help create experiences for people so that they can feel what my brother felt and they can feel what I felt. Uh, so I went on to become a navigator and I uh, got to hold space. Uh, the sanctuary that G talks about, I got to be a part of creating that sanctuary. Um, and now I'm just so honored that I get to be a director here and a part of really the culture and maintaining that sanctuary and being intentional about the experiences that we create. So through case management, we want our team to connect people with people first so that they feel safe because a lot of people from our population, they can't even articulate their needs yet if they don't feel safe enough to be able to tell you that they need help. So we do our best to create spaces right here where people can feel seen and where they could feel safe enough so they can say, hey, this is what I need. 
and we allow them to be the experts in their life. Uh, we don't tell people what they need to do. We just tell people the truth about their lives, that they are exactly what God had in mind when God created them. And it is the it, it's it's the joy of my life to be a part of this great organization. Thank you guys for being with us today. Thank you, Jose. My name is Connie Cordero. I am a case manager at Homeboy Industries. I've been with the organization a little bit over seven years now. Like Jose, I walked in as a trainee out of, um, I had just been released from federal prison. Um, growing up, I made a lot of bad decisions. I was in and out of the system in juvenile hall. And as an adult, I went in and out of the county jail. And I was pretty much blessed within my adulthood to never go to prison until I was 32 years old. I ended up in federal prison looking at 30 years. At the time I was arrested, I had six children. I had just given birth to my last son. He was 20 days old. So when I was arrested um, and being told that I was looking at 30 years, it was a fight for my own life. And a lot of things, a lot of things changed, a lot of things like that, the way I seen life period, um, how ungrateful I was, how I lived life with like not even thinking about consequences. And what really sat with me is all the hurt that my family had been through. And a lot of it had to do with because of the choices that I made. And at the time making those choices, like I really didn't care about the people that I was hurting. I was an addict for 16 years. I've been clean going on 14 years now. And a lot of my decisions that I made were based behind my addiction. And you couldn't tell me that. 14 years ago, because I would tell you that I wasn't a drug addict. Until I came to Homeboy Industries, I was referred to Homeboys through a friend. Um, I needed to attend tattoo removal, part of my release conditions. So my probation officer wanted me to get my tattoos removed. I walked through the doors and like Jose, it was an experience that I just will never forget the first day walking through. And it was more of like, I don't belong here. Why am I here kind of deal? I didn't want to make relationships with anybody. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I talked to the one individual that brought me. And it was like time went by. I became part of the program. I went through different, um, different parts of our organization. I worked in many of the businesses. I worked with mental health. I worked in the bakery. And then eventually I became a navigator also. And I was able to walk alongside a lot of the trainees. And being that I had a rough childhood, um, my father left us when we were children. My mother raised us the best that she could. And I had been through a lot of things. So when I met, I started to meet people here, it was like, man, a lot of people have been through the same things, you know, I'm not the only one. And little by little, like doing the work on self, being accountable, being honest with myself, admitting to things in the sense being like that, yeah, I did this, like I did, you know? And I made a promise to myself when I was in prison. I said, if I am able to come home because I was looking at 30 years that I would never return back to prison. And I didn't want to be away from my children. I had never been away from them. And when I came home, it was so hard probably within the first year, I was praying that I would go back to prison because I didn't know how to get back on my feet. And I had just been used to living a criminal lifestyle and making money the easy way and being responsible and taking care of my children and trying to look for a place to live. All these things started adding up and it started taking a toll on me and I started getting stressed out and overwhelmed. And being able to come back to Homeboys every day gave me that little bit of hope, watching other people grow, other people do things. And I admired so many people that worked here at the time. And I was like, I'm going to get to where they're at. I'm going to have what other people have. And it just was so hard that I continuously just wanted to give up. And then when I started doing the work on myself, it was like I started to build myself and I started to own my voice and being able to tell my story through tours at Homeboy Industries. And just being like, I mean, it made me feel so empowered. Like I started to feel great about myself and I started to know what my worth was and I had good self-esteem and all these things. And I thought like everything was just great. And in 2015, my brother was murdered and it sent me back to a place where it was just like a dark place. And I didn't want to do the work here no more. I didn't want to be a part of anything that was great because I felt like my life was just swept under my feet, like from me and everything was taken. And the hurt and the pain was just so overwhelming that a part of me just didn't want to live anymore. And I would sit there and say, you've gotten this far. Like, there's no way in life that you're going to stop. Then I would picture my brother's face and I'll be like, I can't do this without him. You know, like it was just so much emotions involved. I was so broken. 
And so many things of my childhood started coming back to me. And then I came back to Homeboys, like, and I found myself and with the help of many people, Father G, Jose, like so many of our employees here, like they were my support and they helped uplift me and to keep me straight. And it was a lot of phone calls every day, every day, every day, because I just wanted a part of me just wanted to die. And I thought about it and it was like, man, I have to learn from this experience. And I learned from it. And from there forward, like being able to, it took me a little bit of time, but I was able to get back into a good place and being able to deal with the hurt and the understanding because you want to hurt people that hurt you. And to see my mom cry broke my heart still to this day. It's like just taking a deep breath and moving forward. But there's nothing in my life that hasn't taught me great lessons. And there's nothing in my life that I regret or any experience that I've been through, do I regret the situations that I put myself in because it's helped shape who I am today. And the work that I do today, being a case manager, I have 30 plus trainees that I see um, on a weekly basis. And I haven't yet had somebody come through the doors and sit in front of me and tell me that they've been through something that I haven't been through. And that's a blessing of the work that we do because for me, the connection is to let someone else know that you know exactly how they're feeling or that you know exactly what it feels like to go through something is that then the wall just comes crumbling down and little by little we start to build trust and we build relationships and homeboys has helped me in the sense being to find myself and know my worth and being able like i cannot fix nobody but i know that i can walk with them through their hard times and i will walk with them through the troubling times and the great moments and the greatest blessing like the work that we were able to do like jose mentioned is like we get to see people grow. We get to see people shine. We get to see people cry. We get to see people mad. But these are all the things that are helping them to move forward and letting them know, like, it's okay to cry. It's okay to be angry. People get mad at me all the time and they come back and they apologize the next day. I was having a bad day. It's okay. Like, it is okay to be broken. It is okay to have a bad day because tomorrow we're going to be blessed with another day and we're going to pick it up and we're going to keep on moving forward. And that's like the best part of my journey here at Homeboys is to know that we don't need to live for tomorrow. We're just living for today. The light shines just for today on us and we make it through the day and then tomorrow is a whole new beginning. And that's how I honestly truthfully live because I know that we aren't promised tomorrow, but the work that we're able to do is like for me is that if I meet with my trainees and they're eager to come back tomorrow when they know they can't see me till next week and they want to see me tomorrow is that then i know that the work is being done and it's just that little bit of hope giving somebody that little bit of hope knowing that we got them and that we're going to love them and that we're going to be there for them and support them that's the greatest part of the work that i do thank you guys for allowing me to share and i'll turn it back over to jocelyn um a sincere sincere thank you jose and connie for sharing your personal stories and for father g for all of you for being here i'm like shaking from your stories and I've been seeing the comments come in on YouTube and I know that the audience has really been moved by them as well. Um, so thank you. Um, Father G, you, you mentioned, you know, earlier that, you know, you, you live through every, the Rodney King protests and all of that. And, uh, you know, as we all know, the, the country is going through something even more magnified these days, I guess, Father G, I'm curious, like any similarities or differences you see from the time then and the time now and any just words of wisdom you can share? Yeah, so we're we're in our 32nd year and, and clearly the first 10 years were marked by death threats, bomb threats and hate mail. So the demonizing was really writ large in our early years that, you know, the, the approach was really ham handed and police uh, centered and wipe them out and lock them up. And, and I think so homeboy announced a message, you know, what if we were to invest in people rather than just try to futilely incarcerate our way out of this stuff. So that has changed because I think people have embraced smart on crime as opposed to tough. And which was all the, all, you know, that people had that presented to them 30 years ago and 25 years ago. And so now as part of the air we breathe in LA County anyway, that people are, are wanting to do something different. Quite apart from that, Homeboy really uh, imagined something different for our country and our world. You know, we're, we're, um, we're kind of the front porch of, of the house everybody wants to live in, you know, a place of kinship and connection and, and exquisite mutuality. So quite apart from the concrete help that 
uh, we provide to gang members and people who are uh, formerly incarcerated is a is an image of the beloved community, or as John Lewis uh, would say, we all live in the same house. So it's kind of the same house is what we propose. We're enemies, rivals, African American, Latino, Asian, a smattering of white folks, <laughs> and and there we are. And it's kind of uh, kind of thrilling to to live and announce yeah. this. Uh, kind Thank of you place. so much, all of you, for for sharing the work, the great work that you you all are doing. Um, I know personally, uh, me and my family were really big supporters of Homeboy, and because we really believe in the work that you do, and today has just reinforced that tenfold. So, um, if you've heard something here today that that moves you to to want to help, I invite you to um, visit homeboyindustries.com or to, org. Sorry, to to donate, give whatever you can, and for Googlers, you know that Google will uh, generously match your donation. So, um, thank you again, Jose. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Father G. So much for for joining us today. Thank. You. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.